My name is Edward Thompson. Uh, I'm really excited to be here, and I'm I'm really happy to see all the uh, uh, diversity efforts. I've never been on stage with, uh, and it's not ASL. It's is it BSL? A BSL translator before, but I'm really excited. I'm really pleased, uh, and I don't think I've ever been. Uh, live uh, transcripted either. So very exciting. I'm really happy to see that. I'm ready whenever you are. <laughs> Great. So again, my name is Edward Thompson. Uh, I'm a product manager at GitHub. Today I'd like to give you some top tips for using Git. I think that's very important whether you're on the dev side of the house writing code or on the off side of the house using config as code or infrastructure as code. So first, top tip, use a git attributes to manage your line endings. I think it's really important to use git attributes because you can check this configuration into your repository. That means everybody has the same configuration. Let's rewind just a second. What does it mean to be a line ending? Well, if you're not familiar with this, on Unix systems, you use one character to say, hey, go to the next line in a text file. On Windows, you have two characters, a carriage return and a line feed. So this is like some historical baggage that we've just kind of got to deal with. But fundamentally, when you look at a text file, like visually, side by side, on a Unix machine and a Windows machine, even though they appear the same, they are not, because they've got these different control characters for the end of the lines. Now, our goal here is really to have Git handle this for us. So that if I'm editing a file on a Windows machine, I get Windows line endings, check it in. One of my friends, colleagues edits a file on a Unix machine, they get Unix line endings. So that's sort of the goal, but there's tricky ways to get there. A lot of people will tell you to use core.autocrlf. You'll see this in the Git for Windows installer. You'll see this on Stack Overflow. Don't do it. This is really bad advice. The problem with core.autocrlf is that everybody sets it independently. So you and I are working in the same repository. I set my core.autocrlf one way, you set it a different way. Now we're actually checking files into the repository in different formats. So when you have these two settings wrong, when you disagree on them, you get Unix style line endings on Windows and Windows style line endings on Unix. It's no good, it's the exact opposite of what you want in fact. The nice thing about Git attributes is you check this into the repository, so everybody using that repository has the same settings. I recommend star text equals auto. That means the native line ending configuration on every platform. But fundamentally, I don't care what you put in there as long as you put something in there so that everybody agrees. That way, everybody has the same information going into the repository. You'll never run git status and, and see phantom changes. Tip number two, use git LFS for binary files. I should probably clarify this a little bit because what does it really mean to be a binary file with git? A lot of people think git doesn't treat binary files well. That's kind of true. It's not really about whether it's binary or not. It's about the size. And so if you have one file that's really big, maybe it's a, a movie or an image, and it never changes, that's okay, Git fundamentally doesn't care about this. The problem is when you have a lot of binary files that change frequently. You're updating an image over and over again. That's because when you check that in, you'll get a copy uh, of every revision in the repository. So you, when you run git clone, when you run git fetch, you'll get all of that data. So if I'm manipulating like a 75 megabyte ping and I'm making changes over and over again, I get that file actually in the repository. So when I run git clone, I'll get every revision, even though I don't need every revision. Git LFS changes that. So instead of when I run git add and git commit, putting the actual binary into the repository, I put a little pointer file that has metadata about the image and where to get it. And that way when I run git clone, I only get the most recent version of the image. So I'll get all the metadata, all the historical information about the image, but when I go to check out that latest version, it'll only put the most recent version on disk. So that means when I run git clone, it's very efficient. I only get the metadata and the images I need for the latest revision. And it's very time efficient. So it's quick. Uh, it doesn't take up a lot of disk space unnecessarily. Finally, top tip number three, know how to recover data with Git. Because I've used Git for a long time. I've actually written parts of Git and I still get rebase wrong every day. 
I'm sure you do too. It's okay, we'll start a support group later. In the meantime, know how to recover data when it goes wrong. First of all, the command git ref log is your friend. It will show you the branches that you've been on and the commits that you've been on so you can go back to them. Finally, git recover, it's an extra download. It's not part of git, but it can show you the files that you've run git add on and never committed. So just run git add, then you can run git recover, and you'll get that data back even if you never committed it. This was real quick, aka.ms git underscore top underscore tips, and thanks so much.